as people around the world celebrate the eight days of Hanukkah, here are 10 great reasons for God's people to be thankful for the historical Hanukkah. The Hanukkah event provides an opportunity for common ground dialogue between Jewish and Christian brothers and sisters. The historical setting of Hanukkah helps to better understand the context of parts of the Old and New Testament. A study of the religious and political context of events leading up to Hanukkah is essential to understanding the first century. In fact, Jesus, Yeshua, acknowledged Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. The example of the Jews who stood up against the Greek persecutors serves as a model for those who must stand up against present and future persecutors. The events of Hanukkah are given in prophetic detail in the book of Daniel as a future time of persecution and redemption. Studying the victory of the remnant of Jews over the Greeks during the time of Hanukkah gives us confidence that anything is possible with God. The Maccabees, translated as the Hammers, provide a foreshadow of the coming Messiah. Hanukkah helps us understand the connection between faith and action. The prohibition by the Greeks on the Jewish people against living God's Torah, keeping God's appointed times, and proclaiming God's holy name is a present day challenge for God's people today. The rededication of the altar, or in Hebrew, Hanukkah HaMizbeach, serves as an invitation for God's people to rededicate our lives to our Heavenly Father. Well, there you have it, 10 great reasons for the people of God to be thankful for the historical Hanukkah. All right, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, Hanukkah. Um, uh, today is the, uh, I believe it's the fourth day of Hanukkah, is that right? And uh, I grew up with this festival, the festival of Hanukkah, which uh, being raised as an Orthodox Jew, what this was all about was lighting the Hanukkah lamps one every day for eight days. And what I was taught from one of my earliest memories is I was taught that this represents the miracle that when the, uh, the Greeks took over the temple in the year 168 B.C., and they began to uh, offer sacrifices to their pagan deities there. And the Jews rebelled against this. And when the Jews finally drove the Greeks from the temple, they found only one cruise of oil, one vial of oil, that had the seal of the high priest indicating that that oil was still holy. And so they put the oil on the menorah, on the lamp, in the temple. And of course, the menorah in the temple has seven branches. And, uh, they needed it to burn that one vial of oil in those seven lamps. They needed it to burn for eight days. And why eight days? Because it takes eight days to undergo the ritual of purification in Numbers chapter 19. That, by the way, is mentioned also in the book of Acts, that Paul underwent the same ritual of purification, this eight-day purification rite. And finally, um, they, uh, excuse me, it's a seven-day purification rite. <laughs> there was one day of oil, and then we needed seven extra days. And then finally, the, uh, when they had the oil, they were able to purify themselves and make new oil. They, uh, the oil burned that entire time, allowing them enough time to make new oil. And this was the miracle of Hanukkah, I was always taught. Now, when I was growing up, and many of you already know my story, that I'm what's known as a, a Karite Jew. You, do you all know what a Karite Jew is? Who, who here has no idea what a Karite Jew is? Don't be embarrassed, raise your hand. Okay, and I'll get this question very often, what is a Karite Jew? And I've uh, mentioned before how Keith and I were traveling to this one place, and the lady walks up to us, the pastor of this church, uh, this is a speaking in tongues inner city church. And she says, Nehemiah, what is a karate Jew? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so it's got nothing to do with karate or martial arts. It's karate. And uh, growing up, I, rituals like this thing of the menorah, of the, of the Hanukkah menorah, of the lighting of the eight days, when we make this, when we light the, the Hanukkah menorah, we make the blessing. I grew up making this blessing, and here it is. It says, Blessed out thou, Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to light the Hanukkah lamps. And when I was growing up, I went to my rabbis and I asked them, where in scripture are we commanded to light the Hanukkah lamps? And remember, I'm, I'm growing up as an Orthodox Jew, an Old Testament Jew. And uh, in my Old Testament, my Tanakh, my Hebrew Bible, it doesn't even mention Hanukkah. The events of Hanukkah took place between the years 168 and 165. The last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. 
which is several hundred years earlier than that. So I went to my rabbis and I said, where are we commanded to light these Hanukkah lamps? And they said, well, strictly speaking, we're not commanded in scripture. However, God commanded us to obey the rabbis, and by obeying the rabbis, we're obeying God. And that's what we mean by the blessing. And when I was told this, I, I, was, I asked the next logical question, where are we commanded to obey the rabbis? And I was told, what? I was told stop asking so many questions. Um, and I realized, as I was reading scripture, and I would read the teachings of these rabbis, and they seemed to me just words of men, and I was told that the, right, the teachings of these rabbis were binding on us like the word of God, and I said, shouldn't we throw away these words of men when they conflict with the word of God? And, and they said to me, no, you mustn't say that. That's what those heretics, the Karaites, say. I said, I said, tell me about the Karaites. They sound like they know what they're talking about. And I realized I was a Karaite Jew. And I didn't know there was such a thing. I was actually told by my rabbis that you can't be a Karaite Jew because they, they have ceased to exist. If you become a Karaite Jew, then you too will cease to exist. It's a dead end. This is what I was told. I, and you know, I was a little kid. And this is a scary thing to say, say to a kid. If you, you know, follow this belief, what's in your heart, you're going you're gonna to die. You're going to cease to exist. That's a really scary thing to say. And I said, I don't care. If I'm the last one on earth, I don't care because I know this is the truth and I have to follow it. Later on, when I grew up, <laughs> well, years later, when I was a little bit older, I found out that I wasn't the only Karite Jew in the world, that this was, there aren't very many, about 35,000 in the whole world. But this is what they told me to intimidate me to keep me away from the truth, to scare me away from the truth. And for me, Hanukkah for many years represented the ultimate uh, rebellion against God because it was about lighting these Hanukkah lamps, proclaiming the God-given authority of these rabbis, which God never gave them. That's what Hanukkah represented to me. When I was a little bit older and studied at Hebrew University where I did my master's in biblical studies, I, I started to look at all kinds of ancient sources and I found out that that wasn't really what Hanukkah was originally about. That Hanukkah, it turns out, the Feast of Dedication in ancient Jewish sources was hijacked by the rabbis. And, and what we found, I found in the earliest sources was it all began at this little place. This is a place in the Judean mountains called Modi'in. Say Modi'in. Modi'in. Modi'in is a beautiful city. It's got flowers and, and those, these horrendous buildings up on the top that they say look like the Transformers. And every time I drive by these buildings, I can't help but do that little song, Transformers, more than meets the eye. But, <laughs> but other than these hor horrible, ugly buildings, Modi'in is a beautiful city in the Judean, uh, western edge of the Judean hills. And by the way, my sister, my, uh, one of my younger sisters, is a real estate agent in Modi'in. In fact, the best real estate agent in the entire town. If you have any doubt about it, just ask her. She'll tell you. Um, and uh, it's, it's gearing up to be Israel's third biggest city after Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, Modi'in. And, but uh, 2,200 years ago, Modi'in was a tiny little village that was barely on anybody's map, that nobody even barely knew it existed. And what happened is the Greeks, uh, under Alexander, came and conquered the entire Middle East. And then in Syria, they set up an empire called the Seleucid Empire, under General Seleucus, and, uh, who began in the year 312 BCE. And he ruled over Israel. And in the year 168, approximately, they began this policy of stamping out the Jewish faith. And they didn't really hate the Jews, what the Greeks wanted to do was to unify their empire. And in their empire, they had Zoroastrians, and they had Canaanites, and they had all kinds of Babylonians, all kinds of different religions who worshipped all kinds of different gods. And they said, if we really want to have a unified empire, we need everybody to come together uniformly and worship the same god, follow the same culture. And of course, being Greeks, they said it should be the culture of the Greeks. And so instead of worshipping uh, Tammuz, you're going to worship Zeus. And instead of worshiping Baal, you got to worship Zeus. Everybody's got to come together. And what many of the people did is they said, okay, what, you know, who cares? Baal and Zeus, it's really kind of the same thing. And Tammuz and Zeus, it's really kind of the same thing. You want me to call Tammuz by a different name? You want me to call him Zeus? I got no problem with that. No problem. You want me to call Mithra by the name Apollo? We could work, we, we could work together. You know? Just make sure that Mithra's birthday and... and and Apollo's birthday are the same day, as, you know, as long as we're, we're clear on that. So most of the people in the empire lined up, no problem, we'll do whatever you want, and they followed uh, the, these, uh, these decrees of the Greek rulers, of the Seleucid Greeks. There was one little province, a tiny province, on the way to Egypt called Judea, and they were making trouble. And so what the king did is he got many of the people in the Judea, of Judea the Jews, to, uh, to follow his policy, 
and he sent those people out to convince their brothers and sisters. And when they came to this one town, the town of Modi'in, that little village on the western edge of the, of the Judean hills, they set up an altar at the center of Modi'in on top of the hills where the transformers are today. And they, uh, right up there, they set up an altar on top of those hills and they called all the people of the village and they said, you must come and eat this pig being sacrificed to Apollo. And the people were horrified. I mean, there's very few, I don't know if, the, I don't think the Greeks even did this on purpose. I don't think they chose the pig to offend the Jews. They were just following their customs and traditions. That's what they did. They sacrificed the, you want to give the fattest and, and uh, most rich uh, food to the God, right? That's what you want for yourself, the fattest and rich food. You know, these were ancient cultures where people starved. So you didn't give them chicken, you gave them pig. And so they brought the pig and they sacrificed it and they called the people up and they said, if you don't eat this sacrifice, you will be put to death. Well, there was one family led by a man named uh, Matthew or Mattathias, Matityahu, and he led his, his five sons in an uprising against these Greeks. And they were priests. And no one thought they would succeed. They didn't think they would succeed themselves because they were fighting what was at that time the superpower of the ancient world. I mean, this was, you know, think of 20 years ago, the Soviet Union or the way the United States is today. They were going up this little tiny, I mean, this would be like, I don't know, the Bahamas leading a war against the United States. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, and this is what happened. They rose up against the, the Greeks and they were living, it says in the books of Maccabees, like animals out in the wilderness. And the Greeks would march their armies down the road and the, and the Jews would come out of little, literally little holes in the ground. They would scurry out of little holes, attack the Greeks and then run back and hide. And they thought, well, we're never gonna defeat them, but at least we're not gonna eat that pig. And at least we'll be able to circumcise our children and continue to practice the ancient faith of our fathers. This is what Hanukkah was originally about. And after five years of fighting, they came and they liberated the temple. And when I read this in the ancient Jewish sources, the earliest Jewish sources that talk about this is one Maccabees and two Maccabees, written shortly after the events. And I was reading through these books many years ago, looking for the story of the miracle of the oil, the one that the rabbis say, God commanded us to light the oil. And I was reading through it, and the details in these, these books are, are, I'll be honest with you, I actually fell asleep many times reading these books. <laughs> They're very, very boring, because it'll say Judah came with 5,000 men, and he marched from this village to that village, and there were 300 horses, and like, come on, seriously, I, like, this is boring. Uh, great detail the stories are given in, and then they describe the liberation of the temple. And what do you know? Not a single word about the eight days of the miracle of oil. Huh. How can that be? Not a single word about eight days of miraculous oil. Nowhere, anywhere. They do talk about what the miracle was, and the miracle was defeating the Greeks and liberating the temple and then dedicating the altar. Now why did they dedicate the altar? Because the Greeks had sacrificed pigs on that altar, which invalidated it. So they came into the temple and tore down the altar, built a new altar, and that was the altar that, that Zerubbabel, the, the Jewish leader who had led the Jews back to the land of Israel after 70 years of exile in Babylon, he had built that altar himself. They said, it doesn't matter, that altar's been defiled, we must tear it down. They tore down the altar and built a new one, and then they dedicated it, and they dedicated it for eight days. Why eight days? Not because of eight days of miraculous oil. They dedicated it for eight days because when Moses dedicated an altar, he dedicated it for eight days. And when Solomon built an altar, it says he dedicated it for eight days. Those are both in the Bible. In their tradition, they knew that when Nehemiah, who I'm named after, dedicated his altar, he also dedicated his for eight days. So that's why you had eight days of oil. That's the earliest, excuse me, that's why you had eight days of Hanukkah, <clears throat> the dedication of the altar. And when I read this, I realized that makes perfect sense. I grew up singing songs about Hanukkah Tamizbeach, the dedication of the altar. That's the early, that's, to this day, Jews refer to the holiday, the full name is Hanukkah, the short name is Hanukkah, the full name is Hanukkah Tamizbeach, dedication of the altar. That's what it's really about. And when I realized that, I realized the rabbis have hijacked this holiday, made it into something about lighting lights that proclaim their God-given authority. And really what we need to do is take back this festival, not throw it away, but take it back and turn it to what it was really about. Now I want to talk a little bit today about one aspect of Hanukkah. Um, and uh, this is something I came across in a source called Megillat Ta'anit, which is one of the earliest Pharisee sources, a Pharisee source dating to uh, before the year 70. It describes a series of days on which people were not supposed to fast because these were days of celebration. And one of those days 
was the third day of the seventh month, the third day of Tishrei. And the reason they were celebrating was that the, the Greeks had made decrees on that day. And then on the anniversary of that day, the decrees were, were overthrown and validated by the Jews resisting the Greeks. And here's what it says in Megillat Ta'anit, explaining the third day of Tishrei. It says, the Greeks made decrees to eradicate Israel. And how did they do that? They ordered them not to deny the kingdom of heaven, to declare that they have no portion with the God of Israel, and not to mention the heavenly name on their lips. This is what the, the, the eradication, and it uses the word eradicate. The same way, the same exact word that Jews use when they speak today about what the Nazis tried to do to us. Shmad, la hashmid, to, de to destroy, to eradicate. Their policy of eradication wasn't the way Hitler tried to do it, by wiping out our bodies. They wanted to wipe out our souls by cutting us off from the God of Israel, by causing us to deny the kingdom of heaven. Now some people are going to be a little bit nervous because there's a Karite Jew here. I'm not Christian, I'm not Messianic, and I'm up here talking about the kingdom of heaven. And I know some of you are nervous saying, well, what does a Jew who doesn't believe in Yeshua have to do with the kingdom of heaven? But kingdom of heaven is an ancient concept. When John the Baptist traveled through the land of Israel speaking about the kingdom of heaven, that, he, people didn't say, well, we don't know what that is. We're Jews. We don't know about the kingdom of heaven. No! They heard kingdom of heaven. They said, we've been looking forward to that where Yehovah comes down to earth and rules as the king of the world. Hey. Yeah. We want... You know, Zechariah talks about him standing with one leg on either side of the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives splitting in the middle and he's going to be king on that day over the entire earth. And what does the other uh, half of that prophecy say? It says, on that day, he will be one and his name will be one. So this kingdom of heaven, that's something we've been looking forward to for a very long time. The prophets promised it and I believe it will happen. May it be soon when the smoke clears. Uh, <laughs> But the Greeks wanted us to deny the kingdom of heaven. They said, you want, your, your, you want your God to be king and David, his servant, to be his representative on earth? No. Uh, Antiochus, he's your king, Antiochus. You know, and Antiochus, the king of the Seleucids, he called himself, you know, each king of the Seleucids had a number. There was Antiochus I and Antiochus II and third. And the one who tried to eradicate Israel was called Antiochus IV. And his surname, his... Uh, his uh, uh, epithet, his title was Epiphanes or Epiphanes, which means he who reveals himself. He was claiming to be God, and he didn't want anybody calling upon the name of any other God. If you want to talk to his father, who is Zeus and Apollo, the, the, you know, because he was a son of a god. That's how the, uh, the pharaohs, they claimed to be sons of gods, and the Babylonian rulers, and Antiochus, following in that tradition, claimed to be a son of a god. And he said, if you want to call on my name or the name of one of my fathers, that's fine. But that Jewish God of yours, you dare not call upon. He did not want them to call upon the name of the Jewish God. And I realized that this, this festival of Hanukkah, I mean, look, the first reference to this uh, miracle of oil doesn't appear until around 200 AD, 200 CE. Now, why does it only appear in that period? When I was researching this, I realized that something happened in the year 70 that changed everything. What happened in the year 70 is the Romans came and destroyed the temple. And so the Jews were left with this uh, eighth-day festival, this eighth-day festival of celebrating the dedication of the altar, an altar that was now destroyed. And so the rabbis, in their ingenuity, came up with a new significance of this altar. And there had been references to oil, not the oil of the eight days of burning. There was an, another oil, you can read about that in 2 Maccabees. Um, when they dedicated the altar in the time of Nehemiah, they poured oil on the altar and it ignited. And they believed that that was... A miracle uh, it didn't burn for eight days. It just burned until the sacrifices were consumed. But they believed that this was a miracle of fire coming down from heaven and igniting the altar, just as it had done in the time of Moses and in the time of Solomon and in the time of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And they believed that that happened in the time of Nehemiah through this nafta oil that they talk about. You can read that in 2 Maccabees yourself. But the first time we hear about the eight days of miraculous oil, that's only around uh, 200 AD, 130 years after the destruction of the temple. And that was because the rabbis had to give this festival new significance. And what I realized is rather than, uh, you know, I, I'm very much about breaking free from tradition. In fact, I was going to put on a tie this morning, which is really against my nature as an Israeli. And I decided that I was going to break free of the bonds of tradition and not put on a tie. I was... Not going to be tied down by tradition. And it was also because I was sweating up a storm, but whatever. But that made him a much better story. Uh, 
Uh, I want to talk to you about something that happened in the time of the Maccabees. There were five brothers led by Judah the Maccabee. And he, who here can name one of the other five brothers? Everybody except for Keith. Simon, who else? Elazar, very good. Who else? Yeah. Judah, we said Judah. Okay. Is this like, na it's like a Jew naming the 12 disciples? Is that what this is like? Okay. All right. So I want to talk about something that happened with Elazar at the Battle of Beit Zechariah, or Zechariah. And that was a battle that took place um, during this three-year uprising against the Greeks. It was one of the definitive battles. And at the Battle of Beit Zechariah, it says how the Greeks came with their full army. This wasn't just a raiding party to try to force the Jews to follow their decrees anymore. This was the real deal. They came with what's called an expeditionary force. 100,000 foot soldiers, we're told. 20,000 horsemen and 32 war elephants. Now, the horsemen and the foot soldiers must have scared the bejesus out of the uh, Israelites because, you know, how many people were in all of Judea? I don't know, maybe a quarter of a million or something like that. And there's 100,000 foot soldiers, 20,000 horsemen, and the 32 war elephants. These were people intimidated by camels. And they see 32 war elephants, and they are terrified. And it talks about, in the book of Maccabees, in 1 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 41, I want to read this verse. It says, And all who heard the noise made by their multitude, by the marching of the multitude of the, of the army of the Greeks, and the clanking of their arms, trembled for the army was very large and strong. And it describes, it goes on to describe how they were fleeing before this army. I mean, the Jewish army didn't even come out to fight them at first. They were terrified. They heard the 32 war elephants and the 100,000 men and the 20,000 uh, horsemen, the cavalry, and they said, this is too much for us. And they just fled at them, fled before them. And uh, I have brought here a shield, and I have here a sword. And, I, and this is what they heard. This is what, why the Jews fled, because they heard the clanking of the arms. Now imagine 100,000 people are clanking their weapons like this. It'd be terrifying. I mean, there's almost as many people there as there are able-bodied men in all of Judea. And that's just the expeditionary force come to enforce the rule of the king, forbidding them from speaking the name of their God and practicing circumcision and keeping the Sabbath. I mean, they, they were terrified. They fled. And there were two things that terrified them that made them flee. We read in that verse. There was the noise made by their multitude, and there was the clinking of the arms. Well, I want to do something that I learned from Keith. I'm going to ask everybody on this side of the room, we're going to do this, say, noise of the multitude. Noise of the multitude. And you, I'm going to ask, say, clinking of arms. Clinking of arms. Let's try that again. Noise of the multitude. Clinking of arms. Okay. And, and you guys clap when you say clinking of arms. Okay, so this is what terrified the Jews who saw this army coming. They heard, they saw the 100,000 men, 20,000 foot soldiers, 32 elephants, and they were terrified by? Now, there was one man who saw all this, and he said, I'm not going to be afraid and intimidated. And this was one of the brothers of Judah the Maccabee. His name was, his name was Elazar. Elazar heard this. And he saw all of his brothers running away, and he saw that one of the 32 elephants was bigger than all the others. And it, had, it was adorned with royal garb and gold and silver, and he realized this has to be the elephant of the king. And he grabbed his sword. It probably wasn't as big as this. It was probably up to here. He grabbed his sword, and he ran towards the elephant, knocking men to the right and to the left. And he took his sword, and he plunged it into the belly of the beast. Now, what gave him the gall? the guts to do that. I mean, he, he had to know that that was a really dangerous thing to do. What gave him the guts to do it? And I think what gave him the guts to do it is another battle that happened not far from Beit Zechariah, Beit Zechariah, from the very near, uh, another battle that happened near the very same place. It's mentioned in the book of Samuel, one of my favorite stories. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is when David goes out against, against Goliath. And when David goes against Goliath, he says to Goliath, in uh, verse 45, it says, You come to me with sword. Now, this is sword. This is just one of Goliath's weapons. This is scary. <laughs> if this were actually sharp, it would be quite scary. You come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin. 
Goliath was a big guy. He had, three, he had his main weapon and two backup weapons, just in case. And I come to you in the name of Yehovah of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have, uh, and the word there, cherafta, literally means who you have insulted. So Goliath was going out there every day and saying, you Israelites who believe in that God of yours, Yehovah, you've got no chance against us. We're going to defeat you. Your God is powerless against us. And David heard this and he said, I'm not going to go for this. And he took five smooth stones and he went out against Goliath and he faced him. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, thou, uh, well, it was about a thousand years later, 800 years, 900 years later, Eleazar the Maccabee, he was going into a battle very near where that happened with David and Goliath, not far away. And he saw this massive army and he said, they're coming to me with sword, spear, and javelin. They're coming to me with foot soldier, with cavalry, and with elephants. And all I've got is the name of Yehovah of hosts. And he must have grabbed that sword and gone for the elephant and said, Yehovah! And lunged it into the heart of the beast. And this is one of the, the most famous stories. I grew up with the story, famous stories in Jewish lore. And that beast, he killed the beast and everyone on the beast when, the, when it collapsed, but it fell on him and killed him too. But eventually, I mean, that's what dedication is about. Dedication isn't just going out and saying, well, I'm going to stand by, by my beliefs as, as long as everything goes right. As long as I know that I'm safe and secure, I'm going to stand by my faith and my beliefs. Dedication is going out and knowing that this could cost you your life. This could be the end. This is going all the way. When David went out, he took five smooth stones. And I'm sure he was expecting success, but it wasn't guaranteed. He might have shot all five stones and, and not, not one. That could have happened. That's happened in the history. It happened in the uh, examples in the Bible where it happened. And David didn't care. This man had insulted the name of the God of Israel. He went out against him and he killed him. And Eleazar did the same thing, and it cost Eleazar his life. And that's what dedication is about. It's not just about doing what you know you're going to be successful at, and that's going to, everything's going to be fun and rosy. It's about really standing by your convictions, even when it costs you. That's the message of Hanukkah, for me at least. Um, <clears throat> here's another person who stood by his convictions. This is a tomb up in the Galilee, uh, outside of the little town of Carmiel. And it's a tomb of, a tomb of a rabbi that most of you probably have never heard of. And frankly, I never heard of until a number of years ago when I came across his name and he was mentioned in the list of 10 rabbis who were martyred by the Romans during the time of the Hadrianic persecutions, which ended in the year 138. So this was probably around the year 136, 137, something like that, when he was put to death. And the reason he was put to death, when I read this, I was very surprised. By the Romans. This is what the Talmud says, the writings of the ancient rabbis, they talk about Hanina ben Teradion, and it says they sentenced him to be burned, the Romans sentenced him to be burned, because he used to pronounce the name the way it is written. The name of the Father, the name of the creator of the universe. They took hold of him, wrapped him in a Torah scroll, surrounded him in bundles of branches, and set them on fire. This is how the Romans punished a Jew who spoke the name of his God. Now this was shocking to me, because this happened around the year 136, and it was less than... 200 years, oh, I'm bad at math, about 300 years earlier that Antiochus had made this decree forbidding the Jews from speaking the name of their God. That was part of his uh, policy to eradicate Israel. Well, if you read in ancient Jewish sources, you read about two eradications, two attempts at eradicating ancient, the ancient Jews. The first attempt was Antiochus in the year 168 through 165. The second was by the Emperor Hadrian. And that was the Hadrianic persecutions that killed Hanina ben Teradion. And that second, uh, that second annihilation eradication policy imitated the first. So Hadrian took all of the policies of Antiochus and said, Antiochus wasn't successful because he didn't have the might of the Roman Empire. I'm going to show those Jews what it means if you refuse to worship the Roman gods. And the Rome, you know, for, for the Greeks, this was a novel idea to try to force everybody to worship the same god. That wasn't a novel idea for the Romans. If you didn't worship the Roman gods, if you didn't sacrifice to Jupiter, and you were somebody from uh, Ephesus or Greece or Alexandria, you would find yourself uh, crucified on a cross or put to death in some other horrific way. That was, there was no question about that. There was one group that was exempt from this, and that was the Jews. And that was because they were known to be an ancient people who had this issue about worshiping anybody but their one god. And so the Romans kind of left them alone. 
until Hadrian came along and he said, enough of this, Jews. Enough, Jews! You must worship the Roman gods and no other gods. And he decided he would put an end to this once and for all, did the same exact things as the Greeks, forbade circumcision, forbade the Shabbat, and forbade speaking the name of the God of Israel on their lips. And this rabbi was martyred. Like El Azar, he didn't have a sword. The sword he had was with his tongue. And he went out into the public, uh, public square, and he read from the Torah. And when he came to the name of the God of Israel, he didn't stick some other word in there to, to avoid offending the Greeks, uh, uh, excuse me, the Romans. He didn't stick in a, a replacement word to avoid offending the Romans. He read, Anochi, I am, that's Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, Anochi, Yehovah Elohecha, I am Yehovah, your God. He read in public the name of the God of Israel, and the Romans took him and burned him at the stake, wrapping him in the very Torah scroll that he had read from. Now, this is what dedication means. For me, Hanukkah isn't just about lighting some pretty lamps and giving you know, gifts to my friends. It's about really a true dedication to truly being dedicated. And Keith will talk a little bit more about what the origin of that word Hanukkah is of dedication. But it's about going through the Hanukkah process, hanukkah in yourself, and dedicating yourself, and re really dedicating yourself to the principles that God lays down for us in his word, in his scripture. Can I get an amen? Amen. Um, you know, these, the rabbis came along after the death of Hanina ben Teradion in the year 136, 137, 138, and they said, look, we've had enough people die. Ten leading rabbis were put to death by the Romans during these persecutions. Enough people have lost their lives. What we need to do is decide what we can live with and what we can't live with. And they decided that one of the things they can live with is not speaking the name of the God of Israel in public. They decided we're going to keep this a secret among ourselves. They say that it was transmitted by sages to disciples once every seven years, but in public, in earshot of the Roman collaborators, we will use a circumlocution. We will insert a different name, a different word, in place of the name of the God of Israel. Instead of saying his name, Yehovah, yud heh vav -Hey, we will put in a different word. And in, already in ancient times, there, was an, there were titles of God, of the God of Israel. What are some of the titles of God in the Old Testament? Adonai, what's another one? Hashem is not in the Old Testament, that's a modern term. What's another term in the, in the ancient Hebrew scriptures? Elohim. Elohim means God, Adonai means Lord, El Shaddai, usually translated God Almighty, El Elyon, Most High God. These are all legitimate terms used to describe the God of Israel. And what's interesting is if you add up all of those terms, how many times they appear in the Hebrew Bible, you'll find they cumulatively appear less than the actual name of God, which is yud heh vav -Heh. Some people say it as Yahweh, others, uh, we've explained in uh, some of the other presentations why we pronounce it Yehovah. And you know, there was, there was a man who was meeting with us yesterday, uh, and, and Michael was there. And the man, and this is somebody who Michael has known for many years, and he said, Michael, I see that now you're saying Yehovah. Does that mean if I say Yahweh, I'm going to get kicked out? And I hope nobody gets that impression. Well, I don't know, Michael might kick him out, but I won't kick him out. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, I don't, I don't think it should be about that. You know, it's not about, uh, it is important, I think, to try to, you know, my name is Nehemia. Say Nehemia. And some of you weren't able to say it. Some of you said Nehemia. And some of you will walk up to me and say Nehemiah. And I recently found out that I'm uh, named after the second shortest character in the Bible, Nehi Maya. <laughs> <laughs> Only works in English. And I'm fine with all of those pronunciations of my name as long as you don't call me Baldy. <laughs> That's extremely sensitive. Uh, and you know what? If you call me Baldy, I can live with that. I'm sure the creator of the universe is that merciful. That if we call him Father, if we call him Yeho uh, Adonai, if we call him Elohim, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't forget what his name is. His name is yud heh vav -Heh. The rabbis who banned the name to protect the people, and this is one of the things the rabbis did. They encountered Roman persecution, and they would put in these, what are called takanot. Say takanot. Takanot. Do you all know what takanot are? If you don't know what takanot are, you absolutely, positively must see the video on Matthew 23, in which uh, a rabbi 2,000 years ago, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, 
I think he was called Yeshua or something like that. <laughs> he talks about the Takanot of the Pharisees. Takanot are these man-made laws, rules, and regulations that the Pharisees impose upon the people using what they believe is God-given authority, lighting the Hanukkah lamps and making the blessing. Bless out the Lord, King of the universe, and sanctify us with the commandment, commanding us to light the Hanukkah lamps. That is an example of Takanot. One of the Takanot of the Pharisees, they have many Takanot. One of them is that when the Romans forbade the Jews from having their own calendar of sighting the new moon in the land of Israel, Hill II came along in the year 359 and he said, okay, it's time for Takanot. And the purpose of that Takanot, or Takana, was to get the people through the time until the Messiah would come and restore the, restore the biblical calendar. And this is the calendar that most Jews follow today, the calendar of Hill II. And you can ask any Orthodox rabbi who has studied this, and he'll tell you, yes, when the Messiah comes, we'll go back to the original calendar of sighting the new moon. Just like we used to do up until the year 359 in the time of Hill II. Until then, we're going to follow the Takanot. That's our tradition. It kept us from being killed by the Romans. This is what the rabbis will tend to do. They'll make these Takanot to protect the people from persecution. And there are many famous examples of this. When the Romans came into the land of Israel in the year 63 BCE, under Pompey, they, uh, the Romans all of a sudden said to the Jews, you no longer have the authority to carry out uh, pub uh, public executions. And the rabbis were in a big quandary. They said, we can't execute people. I mean, the Torah says if someone commits murder, we are to put him to death by two or three witnesses. What do we do? So the rabbis made takanot. And the takanot basically made it impossible to, kill, to, to put someone to death in a public execution. They were takanot that said, well, we only execute people if the murderer is first warned by two witnesses before he commits the murder. And then the two witnesses who actually see the murder have to be two separate witnesses. Where does it say that in scripture? Nowhere. But those were takanot. And they were designed to create a situation where the rabbis would never carry out the death penalty. In fact, in the entire history of the Sanhedrin, after the Romans came in the year 63 BCE, there was not one single execution that was ever carried out by, by the rabbis, by the Sanhedrin because the Romans forbade them to do that. It was their exclusive right. And so these um, policies of Takanot were designed to protect the people and the rabbis from Roman persecution. And one of the Takanot was, went like this. It said, if the Romans forbid us from speaking the name yud heh vav -Hey, no problem. We'll insert a different name in place of that. And when the Messiah comes, next week hopefully, we will, that because the rabbis didn't think it would be 2,000 years. <laughs> they thought it would be, I mean, they actually talk in the Talmud how the, how the Messiah is supposed to come in the year 4,000, which I believe is sometime in the third century AD, um, <laughs> about that. Uh, <laughs> that's, you, know, you know how predictions go. Um, anyway, so <laughs> um, wasn't there a guy who said it was like supposed to be last May or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, so the, so the rabbis didn't think it was going to last 2,000 years. They thought this would be a very short process until the Messiah came. And until the Messiah came, they would use a replacement. And in the world to come, which they thought would be next week under the kingship of the, of the king Messiah descended from David, they said, we will go back to using the name. And here's a quote about this in the Talmud, in the Tractate of Psachim. It says, this world is not like the world to come. This is after the ban is already in place. When the rabbis say world to come, they mean the Messianic kingdom in this context. In this world, the name is written Yehovah, and read Adonai, meaning Lord. In the world to come, it will be one, written Yehovah and read Yehovah. And they explain, how do they know this is true? That the Takanot forbidding the name of the rabbis, not of the, the Romans forbade it, and the rabbis said, okay, we'll just institute that ourselves. You don't want us to say the name? We'll wait till the Messiah comes. Why did they know that the name would be spoken in the end time? Zechariah 14.9, the prophecy I referred to before, says Yehovah shall be king over the entire earth, and on that day, Yehovah will be one, and his name will be one. In that day, say the rabbis, everyone will call upon the one name, not on the circumlocutions and the replacements and the titles and the epithets, but on the actual name. All mankind, every human being will call on the actual name of the creator of the universe. Can I get an amen? Amen. I've been hanging out with Keith way too long. Uh, <laughs> you know, here, here's one statement of the rabbis. And why do I bring this? Remember, I'm not a rabbinical Jew. I'm a Karite Jew. I say the rabbis have very interesting things to say, but it's not scripture. But they're the ones who have told us that tradition mandates we must not speak the name. Those very same rabbis who tell us not to speak the name, here's what they say. They say, why does Israel pray in this world but not get answered? Because they do not know the explicit name. What, 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 what the? <laughs> it goes on, it says, however, in the future world, 
uh, the Holy One, blessed he, will inform them of his name as it is written, therefore my people will know my name, which is a quote from Isaiah 52, 6. So these very same rabbis who forbid us from speaking the name, they say, well, this is just temporary until the Romans get off our backs. When the Messiah comes and defeats the Romans, we will, <laughs> which is what they thought, uh, <clears throat> When the Messiah comes and, and rules over the entire world after defeating the Romans, the rabbis believed, we will go back to speaking the name. Yehovah himself will inform us the exact pronunciation of the name. Now, this is from a period in which the pronuncia pronunciation of the name was, had already become a secret. And I mentioned that. It was a secret that they were, sages would transmit to disciples once every seven years. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow if we get to it. Um, where did they get this idea? I mean, this, this sounds like a radical idea. Let's go back to this verse. It sounds radical. Why does Israel pray in this world but not get answered because they do not know the explicit name? I mean, that, to me, that sounds a little bit sketchy, to be honest with you. It sounds like this is some magical formula, that bullets will be flying at me. You, know, you, know, you ever hear of the Lakota ghost shirts? Do we have any Native Americans here uh, in the audience? The Lakota were this tribe in, uh, I think, North Dakota or someplace like that, in the Black Hills, and they believed if you put on this shirt, the special shirt that had been used during the ghost dance, that it would protect you from, from bullets. It was believed to be imbued with these special powers. And when I hear the statement like that of the rabbis, why does Israel pray in this world and not get answered, it makes me think of the Lakota ghost shirt. Like if, I, if this bullet's flying me at me uh, from you know, Arab bullets or tanks or whatever coming at me and I shout out Yehovah, does that mean that, or Yahweh if I say it, or however I pronounce it, does that mean that I'm going to be magically protected? There'll be this force field that'll come, of course not. It's not magic. It's calling upon the name of the creator and him actually performing the action. It's not the name that protects you or that, caught, that has any kind of power in itself. It's calling on him through his name that is the power. He is the power, the only power. And that's important to remember. This isn't magic. But where do they get this idea that Israel doesn't, prayers aren't answered because they don't call on the name? Well, Solomon said this when he dedicated the temple. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 33, he said, When your people Israel are defeated by an enemy... Because they sinned against you, they shall return. Return, that's in plain English, repent. That's what the Hebrew word return means. They shall repent to you, and they shall confess your name and pray to you and ask for mercy from you. So it's not just calling out the name that's magic, but part of the process of repentance is confessing the name, asking for mercy in prayer. That's part of what it means to repent. We've got to return to him. By the way, return to him just doesn't mean... Um, okay, I'm going to say 50 Hail Marys and everything's going to be fine. Repent, returning, repenting means uh, how the prophet Hosea chapter 14 talks about this. He talks about leaving off the evil you've done, replacing that evil with something good, and asking for mercy. Oh, and God has to, to give you mercy. If he doesn't give you mercy, you're, you're out of luck. If you don't get that grace, that mercy, that free gift, he doesn't owe it to you. But if you ask for it, he's merciful enough, merciful enough that he just may give it to you. Okay, I'm way, off the <laughs> I'm way off the script here, so I'm going to go back to uh, <laughs> the topic at hand. I want to talk about this, these uh, circumlocutions. This is a word that I'm hearing a lot lately, and this is one of the things I've noticed in, in the people who are searching for the Hebrew roots, the ancient Hebrew roots of their faith. They'll grab on, latch onto these, these big fancy words, and they'll be making the noise. They'll be the noise of the multitude, and they'll be the clanking of the arms. They'll, fancy, they'll bring these big fancy words to intimidate people. The w I think that was a sign. Uh, <laughs> let me pick up my Bible. So this is what they'll do. They'll pick up these big fancy words and they'll start clanking on the arms to intimidate the people. Boing. No, I better put this on the floor. And this is what the people will do to intimidate you. And they'll bring out these words, circumlocutions. How many people here have ever heard the word circumlocutions? Okay. You guys have a very big vocabulary, much bigger than mine. I had to Google it. Um, <laughs> and they'll bring these big, fancy words to intimidate you. And they'll say, well, you mustn't speak the name of the creator of the universe, or the name of the father of creation, the name that appears in the Old Testament. 6,000, say 6,000. 800. And 28 times. 28. You mustn't say that. Instead, you must use a circumlocution. A who, what, why? And you know, when I found out what this word is, I realized the plain, simple word in Hebrew is the word kinui. 
Kinui is a word that appears throughout ancient Jewish sources, and it simply means a title. And we talked about how God has these kinuyim, these titles. There's a famous passage in the Talmud that talks about the priestly blessing. The priestly blessing is one of my favorite, uh, it's, I don't have a slide, but I'll, let me read you the priestly blessing. I love this blessing. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It was life-changing for me, and I'm actually currently writing a book on it. I love it so much. Numbers chapter 6. What kind of Bible is this? This is a Hebrew Bible. It has these funny little squiggles and dots and dashes. <laughs> Let me read you from the priestly blessing. This is Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. Ye <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his children. Say to them, Thus shall you bless the children of Israel. Say unto them, Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yehovah lift his face towards you and give you peace. And then he concludes in verse 27. He says, V'samu et shemi al b'nei Yisrael v'ani avarachem. And they shall place my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So placing the name on Israel, that is the way to bless the people. And the rabbis in the Talmud come along and they say, well, wait a minute. It says, and they will place my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Well, that can't be right, because God's name is too holy to speak. Right? We've banned the name. We no longer speak the name. And then they explain they say, well, actually, we can't deny that this is clearly with the actual name. And they ask the question, they say, maybe it's just with a kinui. Maybe it says yud vav but when we're, the priests actually speak it, they read yud vav as Adonai, with the circumlocution, with the kinui. And they say, no, don't use a kinui, a title. It has to be with the actual name, what they call the shema miforash, the explicit name. So there's no, that's not disputed by the ancient Jewish sources. The ancient Jewish sources say the priestly blessing Anything else we can talk about and discuss, but the priestly blessing, when the priests make that in the temple, it has to be with the name. And it was with the name up until the year 70 when the temple was destroyed. Um, now, one of the things people have been pointing out is that, well, we don't really need to speak the name because Moses didn't speak the name. And why do they say that? Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, I think I said that once, but I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And so Moses himself called on the creator of the universe who had spoken to him face to face, and he called him Lord. Legitimately, in the Hebrew, it actually says that. You're shaking your head. But Moses called the creator of the universe Adonai. Say Adonai. Adonai. He called him Adonai. There's nothing wrong with that. Moses himself spoke that word, Adonai, out of his mouth speaking face to face to the creator of the universe. So maybe it's okay. We should just say Adonai. We don't need to actually call him his name. Who needs his name? We'll just call him Adonai. Now here's an interesting thing. Look at this here. If you look at this verse, Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, it's kind of like, this is what I call spiritual sleight of hand. Because the, when the, the text says Lord with capital letters, it's actually Yehovah in the Hebrew, yud heh heh which some people pronounce as Yahweh. yud heh vav heh and Moses said unto Yehovah or Yahweh, O oh Adonai. Adonai is what it says in the Hebrew. That's legitimately what it said in the Hebrew. Now, if you look in English, it says Lord the whole time. But there's two different lords, and each of those lords are of a different nature and a different quality. One is the actual name, yud heh vav and the other is the circumlocution, the replacement, the epithet, the kinui, the title. And Moses used the title, no question about it. It's an interesting place. Um, Oh, I looked up how many times Adonai appears versus Yehovah in the Torah, because we're talking about Moses. Adonai appears in the Torah 18 times. It's very venerable, lots of times. 18 is the number of life, chai. Um, how many times does the, does the actual name yod appear? 1,820, 1,800 times. <laughs> now, how can you say that this name is irrelevant when it appears for every time you have Adonai, the title, you have 100 times that the actual name Yehovah appears. I don't know. That, you, can't say, you can't say that's irrelevant to me, or maybe it's irrelevant to you. Here's a really interesting passage where if we take out the name and we use the replacement, and here's the, here's the interesting thing to me. If it wanted to say Adonai in the text of Scripture, 
Moses knew how to write Adonai. He wrote it 18 times. And when he actually wrote yud heh vav -Heh, the name of God, he meant the name, of, the name of the Father. He intended to use that name. And it wasn't an accident he used it 100 times for every time he used the title Adonai. Here's an interesting passage where if we put in the replacement, what we get. Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Let my people go. <clears throat> and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Well, that's what it says in your English Bibles. But what it says in Hebrew is, Yehovah. Thus saith Yehovah, God of Israel, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is Yehovah that I should let it, obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not Yehovah, neither will I let Israel go. And that's significant because Pharaoh knew exactly who the Lord was. He had the Lord of the sun and the Lord of the Nile and the Lord of the wheat and the Lord of the crops. He had lots of lords. He knew who lords were, but he didn't know who this particular God was that the, that the Israelites were calling upon, the God Yehovah. And the story, if you read it closely in Exodus, is all about Pharaoh and the world knowing his name. That's the central theme of the story. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yehovah when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Why did he do this? Why did he reveal himself and go through this? Why? He could have just let Israel go without any trouble. We all know that, right? He could have taken Israel out. He could have twitched his nose, snapped his fingers, and Israel would have been in Canaan, living in the, in the, in the Canaanite fortresses without any trouble. Why did he go through ten plagues? And he says, this is why, so that the Egyptians will know that I am Yehovah when I stretch out my hand against them. When I carry out these ten plagues, they're going to know that this isn't just Moses going out in the desert and having some spiritual experience. This is the living God. And I love that story, the story of the Exodus the story of the ten plagues. The first three plagues, the, the magicians are able to replicate. They can do the blood. Maybe not as much, but they can do the blood. We could do that. Our, our, our magicians do that. And they could do the frogs. They could do the first three. And they could do the lice. Or excuse me, then when it comes to the lice, they say, Etzba Elohim hi. It's the finger of God. <laughs> they know this is real. Up until now, we weren't sure. We thought, yeah, you're a very powerful magician. We know how it's done, sleight of hand. We take that name, Yehovah, and before you know it, we st stick in Lord. Sleight of hand with these circumlocutions. But no, once they had the, pla the fourth plague, they said, Etzba Elohim, it's the finger of God. This is the real deal. And that's why Yehovah did it, so that they would know this was the real deal. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be for you a God, and you shall know that I am Yehovah your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. It wasn't just so the Egyptians would know who Yehovah is, the true one living God. It was so the Israelites would know as well. And in Exodus 9.14, he says to Moses, But indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. <laughs> Woo! <Hallelujah. laughs> now, wait a minute. <clears throat> Now, it doesn't say that I may show my power in you and that my circumlocution may be declared in all the earth, right? No, that my title may be declared in all the earth. It says that my name may be declared in all the earth. And why is that important? Because anybody could be the Lord. Baal, the main god of the Canaanites, his name Baal means Lord. And anybody can be the, even to say creator of heaven and earth. The Canaanites had a creator of heaven and earth. The Egyptians had a creator of heaven and earth. But the name Yehovah, what the rabbis call the unique name, that can only refer to him. And what they talk about in the context of the priestly blessing, they say it has to be with the unique name. Because those other titles, that could apply to other deities. But when we bless Israel, it's got to be in the unique name. And that's why God himself said, and they shall place my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Um, let's look at this, Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. When God first reveals his name to Moses, he says his name, Yehovah, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. This is my name forever. This is my zecher for every generation. Now, the Hebrew word zecher is a really powerful, I mean, this is, it's really important to understand often the, if you get the meaning, of the, the meaning behind the Hebrew word, you get all these flavors of meaning that you lose from the English and from other languages. The word zecher, and it's usually translated memorial, this is my zecher, say zecher. zecher. My zecher for every generation 
It doesn't just mean memory or memorial. It means both a mention and a memorial. Because the Hebrew concept of this word is that you mention it, you summon it up in your memory. That's to remember. It's an active summoning up in the memory. Or you're summoning it up with your mouth, you're mentioning it. And in both of those are zecher. Because in the Hebrew thought, that's the same thing. Actively thinking about it. Whenever I think about my heavenly father, I don't use a circumlocution. I use his actual name. I mention him in my mind. Or I mention him with my mouth. That's what this verse means. And it's interesting that you look at other places, how this, verse is, this word is used, the zecher. He talks about Amalek, that nation that attacked Israel. It says, I will surely blot out. Blot out means erase. I will surely blot out the zecher of Amalek from under the heavens. The mention of Amalek will be blotted out from under the heavens. The memory, the summoning up in the memory of Amalek will be, uh, will be blotted out from under the heavens. That is, in Hebrew thought, to blot out a name so that it's not mentioned and not summoned up in the memory when we think about something. In Hebrew, that's a curse. That's a curse. And, that, and God here is cursing Amalek, saying, I will blot them out from under the heavens. They're zecher. And, um, and in, to this day, Jews will use this as a curse, this phrase, Yemach Shemo V'Zichro, which means may his name and his zecher, his memory or his mention, be blotted out. In fact, I grew up that every single time my grandmother or my mother or father, every single time they said the name Hitler, they never said that name without saying Yemach Shemo V'Zichro, may his name and memory be blotted out. And sometimes they would just say, Yamach Shemo V'Zichro tried to wipe us out. They wouldn't even say Hitler. They would just say that phrase, may his name and memory be blotted out. This is a curse to this day in the Jewish world. To blot out the mention of a name. That's a curse. Now, I'm going to say something. Maybe I should skip this slide. Uh, oh. no. All right, I'm going I'm to bring something very controversial here. So the name uh, Jesus, say Jesus. The name Jesus, Yeshua, and Keith talks about this in one of his other teachings. I think they have a video on this. Um, Yeshua is actually short for Yehoshua, which in English is Joshua. In fact, Joshua, the son of Nun, is sometimes translated in your English Bibles as Jesus. There's two passages like that. Because they knew that Jesus and Joshua are the same name. Yehoshua, Ye Ye Yeshua, for short. And Yeshua means Yehovah saves. That's the translation of the word. There's another meaning that's given in Matthew. It's very common for names to have two meanings. I think we have a teaching on this somewhere. But what I want to talk to you about is this, Yeshu. And this is a sensitive subject because many Jews today will refuse to say the name Yeshua. And instead they call him by the name Yeshu. Now it turns out that Yeshu was a shortened form of Yeshua that we find in Second Temple times that it's got nothing to do with the man from Nazareth. There were people who were, that was simply, you know, like, instead of calling me Nehemiah, you could call, call me Hemi. You know, that's not cursing me or insulting me. But then you could turn around and say, oh, Hemi, that really stands for something else. That's an abbreviation. And turn that into a curse. And that's what the, some of the rabbis did with the name Yeshu, which originally was, like I said, a neutral nickname for Yeshua. They turned it into a curse. And specifically, they turned it into the curse, Yemach Shemo V'Zichro, may his name and memory be blotted out. Somebody say, uh-oh. Now, is that a curse to uh, blot out the name Yeshua? Is it or, or is that okay? Is it okay if I blot out his name and never mention his name? Look, I'm not Christian. I'm not Messianic. I'm asking you. Think about this. Don't just answer what you think I want to hear. It, would it be okay if you were part of a congregation or a church or an assembly and they came to you and they said, the name Jesus or the name Yeshua, Yeshua is too holy of a name. We never want to speak that name again. Never mention it. Would, would you be okay with that? No. Okay, maybe, I don't know. Wouldn't it be okay just to use a circumlocution instead? No. No? This is what people have done with the name of our Heavenly Father, the name Yehovah. Some people say Yahweh. What they've done with the name is said, oh no, we're going to blot out the mention of that name and the memory of that name. We will never speak that name again. And some people have taken it one step further and said, you know what? Yeshua never spoke that name. And Moses didn't even ever speak that name. He said, I don't know. Yeah, 18 times out of 1,820 times. That's true. Uh, but he actually did speak the name over 1,800 times. So <clears throat> I think that's a curse of the Father's name. I don't think that's an honoring the Father's name, a blessing of the Father's name. And even the rabbis who imposed this ban, this taka, these taka note, to protect us from the Romans, and look, I could come now 2,000 years later and criticize them for that. That's real easy. What would I have done in that situation? I don't know. I probably would have saved my life. And in secret gatherings with my friends and my 
rabbis and my, my disciples, I would have said his name, transmitting it from sage to disciple. But if I was in public, and you didn't know who's a collaborator, anybody could be a Roman collaborator. <clears throat> There's an ancient saying where these two rabbis are, uh, or it's an ancient story of the rabbis where there, there's this one rabbi who's blind and, he's, uh, and they're asking him what he thinks of the, of the Roman emperor. And he says, um, he says, you know what? The walls have ears. <laughs> and he never says what he thinks of the Roman emperor. And it turns out that there was a collaborator you know, with an earshot and he didn't know that. So, but this was a real concern. And so they, if I was back then 2,000 years ago, I probably, to be honest with you, would have followed these takanot because I wanted to live and continue to serve the creator of the universe. And I knew as soon as the Messiah would come, he would wipe out our enemies, and we would be able to speak the name of the creator again. Well, you know what? We are coming onto those days. No one is threatening us anymore to speak the name of our creator. They might be clanking the arms and making a lot of noise and using the multitude to say, 2,000 years of tradition! That's the, the noise of the multitude. Tradition, tradition! <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> so they're using the noise of the multitude. 99.99% of the Jews, the multitude doesn't speak the name. Don't listen to that, Karite. That's the multitude, the noise of the multitude, and the clanking of the arms. Don't listen to me. Look at what it says in your Bible in Hebrew. This book that you can get on Amazon.com, the Hebrew Bible. This is the Hebrew Reader's Bible. It has the name Yehovah 6,000, say 6,000, 828 times. Now, if you want to use the circumlocution and replace it with something else, that's between you and your creator. I won't judge you. But I want to be able to stand before the creator on the day of, the universe, on the day of judgment, the creator of the universe on that day of judgment, to be able to stand before him and say, I did the best I could to live by your scripture while I was waiting for your Messiah to come. Rather than say, oh yeah, when the Messiah comes, he'll restore everything. I wanted to do the best I could until he would come. Amen. What they've done is they have banned the name. Woo! Uh, so when I first saw this image uh, on my own computer in Photoshop, um, I was very offended by my own creation. But I realized that this is really what the rabbis have done. And if I was offended by this visual image, I should be even more offended by the actual ban on the name. They've forbidden us from speaking the name. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go past that. Why is it important to speak the name? I want to make this point clear. I want to go back to this verse. Psalm 44, verses 20 to 21. Because some people, what they'll try to do is they, they use this spiritual sleight of hand. They say, you, you know, Nehemiah is up there saying you've got to speak the name to get saved. He's making this into about salvation. He's making this into about, and not only that, you have to speak the name. You've got to speak it exactly. Yehovah, if you say Yahweh, you're going to burn in hell with the Jews. <laughs> I think we have a video about that as well. Um, <clears throat> and this is not what it's about at all. That's sleight of hand, what they're trying to do. You know, they're trying to trick you and confuse you with the noise. Do, do, do. And with the noise of the multitude and the clanking of the arms. That's what they're trying to do. Psalm chapter 44, verses 20 to 21. In Hebrew, it's 21 to 22. It says, if we forget the name of our God, say forget and spread forth our hands to a foreign God, God will surely search it out, for he knows the secrets of the heart. Whoa! Let's stop here for a second. I want every person here to commit later today, whether now or later today, to open up your Bible, whatever translation, and look up this passage, Psalm 44. 20, who is willing to commit to do that yourselves? Because I don't want you to walk away and say, Nehemiah showed us the verse. Will you do that? Yes. Come on. I want you to look it up yourselves and read it for yourselves in the Word of God. It says, if you call upon the wrong name, he's that merciful that he will search it out in your heart and know what you meant. That means if I stand before him and I call out, I won't even say it, but if I call out the wrong name, he will, the name of a foreign God, he'll search it out and he'll know what I meant and he'll be, that, that's grace. That is the free gift. That is mercy. <laughs> I'm excited. Can I be excited? Am I allowed to be excited? Uh, I am a Litvak, and we will now proceed to the next slide. <laughs> no. Uh, um, I mean, this is amazing. So he's saying here, if you call in the name of a foreign god, well, what if I call instead of Nehemiah, I call him Nehemiah or Nehemia, and instead of Yehovah, I say Yahovah or Yehweh 
or Yahweh? <laughs> Does he have the grace and the capacity to search it out in our hearts and know what we mean? Yeah. So this isn't about salvation. This isn't about some magical formula or putting on the magical shirt to protect you from the bullet. They're trying to convince you of that, that we're saying that, and we're not saying that whatsoever. I know that, whatever, that if you, in truth, turn your heart towards the creator of the universe, even if you call on a completely different name, the name of a foreign god, he has that capacity. I'm not saying go call upon the name of a foreign god. <laughs> if you do it on purpose, he searches that out and he knows that as well. So you've got to do the best that you can to call on his name. But if you, in our, and he talks in this psalm about we're, we're taken captives to a foreign land and we don't know any better. If you don't know any better, do the best that you can and try to get more knowledge. This is the way to defeat the Greeks, through knowledge, <clears throat> through empowering yourself. Do you know what the name of the town where the rebellion started against the Greeks, the uprising to resist the Greek persecutions to make us forget the name. What did we call it? What was it called? Modi'in, where my sister is the best real estate agent in the city. Modi'in, what does Modi'in mean? It means, are you ready? Are you ready for it? It means information. Woohoo! <laughs> so we need to arm ourselves in the spirit of Modi'in with the information to take up our sword. <laughs> Take up our sword, she's like closing her ears. Take the sword with the Modi'in and plunge it into the belly of the beast, shouting, Yehovah! Hey. Woo! Hey. Woo! Hey. I need to get me one of these. <laughs> get a sharp one. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a verse that I think is really important. It's Exodus 20, verse 24. And I think this is one of the reasons it's important to call him the name. This is, he says this in his scripture. In every place where I cause my name to be zechered. Remember that word zecher? Zecher means to mention it in your mind, to sum it up in your mouth. Every place. Say every place. Every place. Where I cause my name to be zechered. Say zecher. There I will come to you and bless you. Say bless you. Bless. Now, is he a liar? He's not a liar. He keeps his word, and he promised this. This is in his word. Now here is something, how are we on time? Um, okay, I got plenty of time. All right, <clears throat> is that right? <laughs> okay, so here is something that people, this is actually a very important topic in and of itself, but some of the people who are clanking on the armor, they're clanking the arms and they're making the noise of the multitude, they're trying to bring these big words to confuse you. And so I want to set some things straight here. Bring some information in the spirit of Modi'in to empower you. It's going to be kind of technical. Who here, who's here ready for something a little bit technical? If you're not, then we have some cakes and coffee in the back. And <laughs> no, if you could just bear with me for a few minutes, this is something you need to know. I think anybody who reads the Bible should know that this is part of the text of the Hebrew scriptures in the Hebrew and know what it is. And it is technical, which is why they bring it to try to intimidate you. I want to empower you so you're not intimidated. Thank you. So this, we're going to talk today about, very briefly, about the Cree and Kativ. And some of you are looking at this and say, Cree, why does he say Cree? It says Quere. And this is part of the intimidation process. Uh, we could have spelled this legitimately Cree, say Cree, Cree. like the in, uh, Native American tribe. Cree and Kativ, say Kativ. Kree is Hebrew for the red, say red. red. And Kativ means written, say written. written. So Kree is red, red. and Kativ is written. written. So, all right, so this side is going to be Kree, and I'm going to ask you to say red, the way you read the word in scripture. And over here, we're going to say Kativ, okay? Written. You're going to say written. Okay? So, what does Kree mean? Red. And what does Kativ mean? Written. And how do I say red in Hebrew? Written. Kree. How do I say re red in Hebrew? Green. And how do I say written in Hebrew? Kativ. And how do I say red in Hebrew? Green. And how do I say written in Hebrew? Kree and Kativ, the red and the written. And what this refers to specifically is, and this may be sound, this may sc scare some of you, I can't say the word, uh, <laughs> scare the living daylights out of you, so, some of you, but it turns out in the Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible, of the Old Testament in Hebrew, there are several thousand words that are written one way that are kativ, say kativ, but they are read a different way. Well, what am I talking about? 
Is that, is that like some grand conspiracy? No. Every first-year Bible student knows what these are, and if you learn the Bible in Hebrew, but they don't usually tell you these things because they think you don't really need to know about that. You know, it reminds me of um, my first computer I ever had was a 486SX, 33 gigahertz of uh, power, and uh, <clears throat> it had a hard drive which was 256 megabytes. And I remember saying to a friend, I said, in my whole life, I'll never fill up that hard drive. <laughs> I literally said that, 256 megabytes. Well, one day, I'm sitting on my little uh, computer, my 46SX, which is as slow as <laughs> any, like molasses. I'm sitting there, and I'm typing, and I, I see in something called File Manager. You all know about File Manager? And in File Manager, I see these little files, tiny files called any files. And they all end in dot I N I. And I say, any files? I didn't create those files. And I don't have a lot of space to spare my 256 megabytes. Uh -oh. I better delete the any files. <laughs> now, all the geeks out there are laughing at me because they you know what happened. When I turned on my computer the next day, I got what they call the blue screen of death. <laughs> and I went into the lab and I brought it to the geek that helped me, the, the computer expert. And he was able to do some kind of fancy thing, rebuild the whatever thing of my jigger. And he saved my computer and he said, Nehemiah, keep out of file manager. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you guys access to file manager, the file manager of the Hebrew Bible. Is that OK? Yeah. Or is that, is that dangerous? We might end up deleting some any files, right? No. I think if our faith is strong enough, we'll know not to delete the any files. And we can handle file manager. So let's look at this word over here in Scripture. This appears six times in the Bible, and the word is uh, written in the actual body of the text. It says the word epholim. Say epholim. Now, above the word epholim is a little circle. Every single time it appears six times in Scripture. A little circle. They call it a circlet or an igulit. And the circle, I know because I can read the Bible in Hebrew, is an indicator for me to look in the margin. And I look at the circle, and I look in the margin, and in the margin, the scribe added the following words. He said in Hebrew, read it, tet chet resh mem. That's a word that has no vowels in it. Read it, and it actually says in Hebrew, tet chet resh mem kri, and kri means read it, or read, the way it should be read. And in every synagogue in the world, they don't read it epholim, they read it according to these letters. Every synagogue in the world going back 2,000 years, and let's look at um, this. They don't read epholim, they read it techorim. Now, what does epholim mean? It means actually the, um, <clears throat> the boils of the Black Plague, uh, or the boils possibly of smallpox. It's a boil of a, of a disease. What does techorim mean? The same exact thing. So why write it one way and read it a different way? And what's the real answer? When the Torah was given through Moses, Nobody had a problem with the word epholim. They knew that that means the boil of smallpox, smallpox or the black plague. A thousand years later in the time of Ezra, people started getting nervous. They started to get influenced by superstition. And they said, if we say that word, we might actually get the pox. So they were afraid to say that word. They couldn't take it out of scripture. It was there. You can't remove a word from the Bible. But they said, we don't have to read that word. If we read that word in public, people will go running out of the synagogue. They'll scurry out like rats. We've got to read a different word in its place, a circumlocution, stick in a replacement, the word techorim, a replacement word. And th this is called kri kativ. It's called that because you read it one way, and it's written a different way. And nobody changed the Bible, but they did put in the margin the way to read it publicly in the synagogue. And every synagogue in the world, they read it this way. Don't think this is one group of people or one faction. All the Jews recognize this is the way our scribes have taught us to read it. Let's look at what this actually looks like in the text. This is from the Aleppo Codex, from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27. It says here, uvat afolim. Uh, and by the way, these vowels are impossible in the Hebrew uh, text of Scripture because this is the letter ayin. Say ayin. With a shva. Say shva. shva. And one of the rules of Hebrew grammar is ayin can't get a shva. And so because of that, I know these vowels don't belong to the word afolim. They actually belong to the word tchorim. Because those are impossible vowels for afolim. That is kri kativ. You see here in the body of the text on the left-hand side, it says uva afolim. And in the side, it says uva tchorim kri. Now, you notice there's no vowels, if you can read Hebrew, uh, on the word uva tchorim in the, in the far right-hand side in the margin. The vowels of that word are stuck into the kativ, in the body of the text. 
So far you're with me? So far so good? Yes. Now this happens thousands of times in the Bible. Usually it's not something as drastic as, uva, as actually changing the word. Usually it's something that just indicates how to read a word that could be read possibly a different way. And we'll see an example of that. But why is this important? Because what some of the people making the noise and clanking the arms have done is they've said, well, the vowels of the name of the Father, yud heh vav in the Hebrew text of Scripture, though, that's a Cree kativ. And those aren't even the vowels of the name yud heh vav They're the vowels of Adonai. Should we stop here? Is this file manager getting too dangerous? No, no, no. Okay, so let's look at this here. This is what they argue. They say, well, you have uh, yud heh vav hey, the four Hebrew letters of the name, and in the margin, it... It, uh, we'll have read it Adonai, a little circle indicating to read it in the margin, and that's a, that would be a Kri, or a Kri and Kativ. Kativ, uh, Kativ is the body, Kri is the, the margin. The only problem with this is it's not true. And why do I say it's not true? Because the name appears in the Hebrew text of the Bible 6,000, say 6,000, 6, 800, 800, and 28 times. And how many times does it have the little circle? Zero. So that's actually a lie. So here's what they say. They say, okay, there's no circle. We're not going to lie to you. There's no circle. But we do have this thing that we call um, Cree Perpetuum. And let's look at the Cree Perpetuum. Perpetuum is like from the word perpetual all the time. And a Cree Perpetuum is an instance where we don't need the little circle because everybody knows every time that word appears, it's to be read a different way. And we're almost done with the technical part. I see this man who's like moving in the seat very, <laughs> we're almost done with the technical part. Uh, <clears throat> so they say this is a Cree perpetuum. It's perpetually read as Adonai. And that's why it has the vowels of Adonai in yod heh vav -Hey. What's the only problem with this? It's not true either. It doesn't actually have the vowels of Adonai. And you don't have to be a great Hebrew expert to see that. The vowels that actually appear usually in the Hebrew text of the manuscripts is this is a shva, say shva. shva. And this is a kamat, say kamat. kamat. And here is a missing vowel. And this is the normal over 6,000 times the way the vowels appear. And they're obviously not the vowels of Adonai. Every other instance of a Cree Kativ has the exact vowels of the way it's read in the word written in the body of the script. Just like we saw with Afolim and Chorim, even though the vowels Afolim were impossible. It was a shva and an ayin. Impossible according to Hebrew grammar, but it's the vowels of the word in the margin. I hope that wasn't too technical. Um, so this is actually factually untrue that it's a Cree perpetuum. Now I want to do something very quickly. This is a crash course in Hebrew. I learned this when I was a little kid. There are three Hebrew words that sound like English words. And it can be very confusing to a beginner in, in Hebrew. And the three English words that sound like English words are the words me, say me, me. Who, who, and he. he. What does me mean? Me. Who is, I don't know who, and, uh, or like Doctor Who, and he is referring to a man. Three perfectly good English words that uh, sound identical to Hebrew words, and it's a source of great confusion. And because of that, when I was a kid, we learned this rhyme. And the rhyme said, me is who, who is he, he is she. <laughs> and that's because the Hebrew word me means who. And the Hebrew word who means he. And the Hebrew word he means she. <laughs> me is who, who is he, he and she. Let's say that. Me is who? Me is who. who is he? Who is he? He, is she. he is she. And there will be a quiz on this later. <laughs> I'm not joking. No. Um, actually not. And this is what it looks like in Hebrew. Me is who, who is he, he is she. And why do I bring this? Because we're going to talk about this last word, he, say he, he. which means she. she. Now, I said this, so I brought all this so as not to confuse you and probably did the exact opposite. Whenever I say the Hebrew word he, I actually mean she. Okay. Because that's what the Hebrew word means. Now, here we have an example of a Cree perpetuum, a genuine Cree perpetuum, meaning every time I see the Hebrew word, written in a certain way, it's always read a different way. And the way I see it read is heave, uh, hey, vav, aleph, and I have a little chirik, which is an e. And if I didn't know Hebrew, if I was a complete ignoramus who was just knowledgeable enough to know basic Hebrew, I would read this as heave. But, and that's a, the ketiv. However, it is to be kri read perpetually as he. Every single time, hundreds of times in the Bible, I have the word he which means she, and I always read it not as heave, but as he, even though it's written that way. 
Now, one of the things about a genuine Crete Perpetuum is the scribes didn't want to deceive us. They didn't want to trick us. So when they gave us a Crete Perpetuum, what they did is every once in a while, they would stick in the margin the little note with the circle. Usually they didn't because they expected you to know it. But every once in a while, they would stick that little thing in the margin. And let's look at an example of this, of a genuine Crete Perpetuum. This is Isaiah 30, verse 33, which I think I actually talk about in my other presentation on hell. Um, and here it has the word he, which means she. Say he. he. She. she. And if I didn't know Hebrew, I would read this as heave. And in the margin it says he, and that kuf is short for Cree. Read it, he. That is a classic Cree kativ, and it's a genuine Cree perpetuum because most of the time I don't have the marginal note. I simply have the word heave, which is to be read as he, and you're expected to know that. Here is Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 13, uh, which I think I talk about actually in the presentation on Hebrew Matthew. Uh, <laughs> and here it has the word he three times. It says, um, I am commanding you today, it is not too difficult for you. It is not uh, far from you. It is not in heaven. It is not, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, saying, uh, who shall go up for us to heaven uh, to take it, etc., etc. And it has the word she, which in Hebrew is he, three times, and it doesn't say anything in the margin. That's a genuine creep perpetuum. It has the vowels of the word meaning she, the word he. <laughs> but it has uh, nothing in the margin, and that's a perpetually read as he, not as heave. But every once in a while, it gives us the word in the margin the way it is to be read, just so that we're clear about it. And what they try to say is that the vowels of Adonai uh, are actually put in the word yud heh vav -Heh, and that's a Cree perpetuum, so they claim, except it's factually not true, because they're simply not the same vowels. And show me an example anywhere, I challenge them, to show me anywhere in the entire Masoretic text of the Bible where it replaces, it has the vowels of the ktiv rather than of the kri, meaning where it has different vowels in the way you read it. That just doesn't happen. And it's simply clearly not the vowels of the, of the word Adonai, meaning Lord. And why are they throwing all this information at people? Because they're clanking the arms. They're making the noise of the multitude. They're trying to confuse you is what they're trying to do. What they're trying to say is, we don't even know how to pronounce this name, whether it's Yahweh or Yehovah or Yahuwehi or Yuhu, Wuhu. We don't know how to pronounce it, and therefore we're better off not pronouncing it all, of putting on ourselves the tie of tradition, tightening our tie really tight, and going according to the ties of tradition, and not following what it says in our Bible 6,828 times, because we don't exactly know how to say it. And if we mispronounce the name, it's this magical formula. If we mispronounce it, lightning will come and strike us down where we stand. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. If you call me by the wrong name, Nehemiah, I'm not, you know, that doesn't insult me. Um, we have to do the best we can to call upon the name of the creator of the universe. If I stand before the creator on the day of judgment, and he says, no, my name wasn't Yehovah, it was Yahavaha, I'll say, you know what? I did the best I could using the manuscripts your scribes transcribed for us, the oracles of God preserved by your people. And what more can I possibly do than that? You know, some people will come to me and say, Nehemiah, God has personally told me the name is Yahuwah. How can you say it's Yehovah? And what I respond to them is if that's what God personally told you, then that's what you should answer him in the day of creation and go and do that. That was a revelation for you. I didn't have that revelation. And all I could do is go by what I have in the evidence before me. If tomorrow the Messiah comes and tells us, no, it was yo, ho, whoa, who, <laughs> then I'll accept that without any hesitation. I don't think that will happen, but who knows, it's possible. Um, it's possible that little green men will come down and abduct me right now, okay? <laughs> Extremely unlikely, uh, but I think those are both equally likely, <laughs> or unlikely as it were. But the point is that this isn't something we should be dogmatic about. It's something we should do the best that we could, the best that we can to serve God. And, it, and ultimately, he will look in your heart and ask you, what did you mean? Were you genuinely calling upon my name? Cause, in accordance with the verse where he says, every place I will cause my name to be mentioned, there I will come and bless you. Were you mentioning my name in that place so that I could come and bless you? Were you inviting my blessing, being open to receiving my blessing? calling upon my name the way I taught you in Scripture. He knows that in your heart. And it doesn't matter 
you know, they're trying to confuse you and intimidate you and say, well, but we're not so sure about that and we're not so sure about this. And look, we don't know anything for a fact. There's philosophers who say, how do we even know we really exist, right? And it's true, maybe I don't exist, but I could care less because I think I exist. And to the best of my knowledge, I do exist. Um, or do I? Uh, I think all we have to do is the best that we can. That's all that God expects. That's what it's about when he says it's not in heaven or across the sea. Even if it is up in heaven, do what you have in your mouth and in your heart. That's what he says there in that passage. He says it's not too far from you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. Do the best you can with what you have. I'm going to go past this because this is all technical stuff, and I want to talk about blah. I'm gonna, can I talk about something that's not in the slides, Keith? Michael, is that okay? You know, the last time I was up on this stage uh, at a one of Michael's events, it was a very difficult time in my life. I don't have any slides, so we can turn that thing off. It was a difficult time in my life. I had just spent uh, several days in Chicago where my father lived his entire life, and my father was dying. And, um, and it was a very difficult time for me. I, uh, he, his final wish as he was dying was to spend his last days and weeks in Israel with his, surrounded by his family. And I had to make the decision. Would I continue to go and speak on, on a speaking tour along with Keith, which included a, a Michael event, or would I go and be with my father in Jerusalem? And my father has my four sisters and my mother, but I thought maybe I should do that. And in fact, Michael had called me up and said, look, Nehemi, if you want to cancel, no problem. You have my full support. Go ahead, you don't have to come to this event. I won't hold it against you. In fact, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you to do that. And one night, um, Keith and I did an event in Pennsylvania. And I'll never forget this. He walks into my room, kind of saunters into my room the way he does. And he says, he says Nehemiah, it's come to Jesus time. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, did I hear you right? What? What, what, what do you, what, what, what? We have this agreement. I don't try to convert you. You don't try to convert me. Well, it's come to Jesus time after 10 years. What? Are you serious? And he says, oh, no, no, no. This is a figure of speech. This is an expression that means it's time for a serious discussion. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you, you had me worried there. And what's the serious discussion? He says to me, Nehemiah, you need to cancel the tour to go back to Jerusalem. I will fly with you to Jerusalem to be with your father so that you're with him in the last weeks. And we were actually traveling around doing a tour, speaking about Keith's book. He has a little book called His Hallowed Name Revealed Again. And uh, it's, a, it's an amazing masterpiece. Um, the only problem with that book is that I'm not the co-author. But <laughs> if you can look past that um, shortcoming, it's actually one of the best books I've ever read. And um, we were going around speaking on that topic about the name of the father of creation. And what really set this whole thing in motion was the research we did together on what, the, what your people call the Lord's Prayer on the prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And in that second phrase of the prayer, Yeshua, as he was known, uh, I was going to say as he was known 2,000 years ago, Jesus. No, <laughs> Jesus, as he was known 2,000 years ago, Yeshua taught the Jewish multitudes to, to pray the words, literally in Hebrew, may your name be sanctified. He was teaching people to sanctify the name. And as I was researching this originally with Keith, we realized this is an important message in the Hebrew Bible. This is common ground for Jew and Christian. And it's a central theme of your Bible and my Bible both where they overlap and where they don't. And when Keith wrote this expanded work, Hallowed Name Revealed Again, I decided I need to go on the road with him to speak about this important message. And the come to Jesus time discussion was, Nehemiah, it's time. you got to put that aside. You d don't do this. I'll go back with you to be with your father. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, Keith, this is not a game. This isn't a, for me, this isn't about selling books. And it's not a game. This is serious stuff. For me, this was serious. And I opened up this book, this verse in the bo uh, book of Nehemiah. Um, this verse, let's see if I can find it. And it talks about how the Jews came back from Babylon after 70 years of exile. And Ezra came and he read for them the Torah for the first time. They had never heard these words of the Torah. They knew there was such a thing. They didn't know what the contents were. They'd never read the Torah. And when they read the Torah, when they heard it read to them, they were upset. They were sad. They were mourning. And why were they so upset? Because they realized we haven't been keeping this. We haven't been living by this. And there are curses in this book. If we don't live by this, that, that will be upon us. 
And we have this covenant with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father. We need to be doing these things, these things that He taught us. And here's what Nehemiah says to them, my namesake, in verse 9. It says, Today is a holy day to Jehovah your God. Do not mourn and do not cry. That's what it literally says. For the people were crying when they heard the words of the Torah. And he said to them, Go, eat fat foods and drink sweet things and send portions to those who don't have. That's biblical gift giving. It's not giving presents to your friends. It's giving portions to those who don't have. For today is holy to our Lord. And do not be sad, for the joy of Jehovah is your strength. And when I turned to Keith after I read this verse and I said, it's a holy time for us to go and speak to people about the name of our Lord. This is a time of holiness. Afterwards, I'll mourn. But now we need to do this thing. And we continued to travel. And we traveled around for a number of weeks. And um, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, so I made this you know, speech to Keith during the Jesus time. And like, I don't know, at a certain point, it, it was one of those push comes to shove moments, right? You know, those were words that I said, bold words that I said when my father was sick. And I didn't know he could live for another six months. I genuinely didn't know. He could live for another 16 years. He had an uncle who was hit by a car at the age of 103 crossing the street by himself. Uh, so there's longevity in this family. I didn't know. So he was sick and dying. I didn't know how long it would take him to die. And I was praying that he would live to be 120. Well, we were speaking uh, a few weeks later in, in, uh, in Colorado Springs. And over there in Colorado Springs, um, <clears throat> I was up on the stage. And when I was done, I went off the stage and handed it over to Keith. And I pulled out my, my little cell phone. And there was a text message there from my sister. And the text message, text message said, Dad is dying. And she explained that the family had been called into the hospital in the middle of the night in Israel. And this, this, was, the, this was it. This was the end. And so I went outside and I called my mother. And uh, she told me to say goodbye to my father. She was going to put me on the speakerphone. And, <laughs> and I said to him, I said, I love you. And I said, I will see you in Olam Haba in the world to come. And I said, Baruch Dayan Emet, which is a statement in Hebrew that Jews say when they hear horrible news, and it means, blessed is the true judge. And that's in the spirit of Job, who when he heard the bad news that his ten sons died, ten, uh, ten children, uh, sons and daughters, they said to him, his wife said to him, curse God. <laughs> Look what he's done to you. Curse his name. And Job responded, he said, Yehi Shem Yehovah Mivorach, may the name of Yehovah be blessed. He gives and he takes away. We shall, and he said, we will not receive just the good from Yehovah. We will also receive the bad. We'll receive the situations where we go out against Goliath and we slay him and we're victorious, but we'll also receive the Elazars who go out and slay the elephant and the elephant falls on us and kills us. Yehi shem Yehovah mevorach. May the name of Yehovah be blessed. Well, I went home, or I went back to the hotel that night in Colorado Springs and I called up my mother who was grieving over my father, but there was one thing on her mind. She had a request for me. And her request was, are you gonna say the Kaddish for your father? If you don't know what the Kaddish is, it's this prayer that a Jew say when their parents die. And I had been taught about this, I mean, this is the central duty the Jew has towards his parents, saying the Kaddish. And one of the things I had been taught about the Kaddish is if you say it for your parents, it will elevate their souls into a higher spiritual realm. And when I heard this, you know, me being the Karite, being the scriptural, trying to be purely scriptural, and this being this rabbinical tradition about saying Kaddish to raise the souls of your parents, I, I said, that sounds to me like superstition. That sounds to me like a base superstition. That's not consistent with the word of God. And Ezekiel, he talks about how the fathers won't, won't be uh, punished for the sins of the sons, and the sons won't be punished for the sins of the fathers. And the opposite is true. The father won't, get, won't, won't be blessed because of the, the righteousness of the son, and vice versa. Each human being is judged according to his own actions, not according to those of another. It's Ezekiel 18 and 33. 
And I remember I discussed this years ago with my father. I said, Kaddish, I can't say that for you. I know, I know it hurts you, but I can't do it because the Kaddish is about the superstition. I just, it's not consistent with my scripture. And he was very hurt by that, but he accepted it. But now, now it was a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> my father was actually dead and my mother had one request to say the Kaddish. And uh, I had to make a decision. And I went to Keith, as I often do when I have difficult situations, and we were, this may sound a little bit strange for a grieving son, but we were sitting in the hot tub at the hotel. This, this is what we do. We go into the hot tub, and we have our most profound breakthroughs. <laughs> we're sitting in the hot tub, and I tell him about the situation with the Kaddish, and he says, Nehemiah, I know we talked about the Kaddish when we did the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer book, but I don't remember what that was. That was like four or five years ago. Remind me what Kaddish is, because we talked about a lot of things. And I recited it for him from memory, what I remembered of it. And he's looking at me with that look he has, and he says, you're kidding. And I say, why am I kidding? What, what did I just say? I don't even know. And I think about the words I just translated for him, what the, you know, because the Kaddish had represented the superstition to me. But when I realized, when I actually recited the words, I realized this is exactly what we've been doing. The Kaddish is this prayer which talks about, Kaddish means sanctification. And it's a prayer of sanctifying the name, the great name of God. And this is exactly what we've been doing, traveling around the country, sanctifying around the world, sanctifying the name of God. And speaking about, and here I have, a, let me read you, if I can find this on my iPad. Let me pull this up for you. Here it says, um, the prayer says, May his great name grow, and exalt, grow exalted and sanctified in the world that he created as he willed. So it's speaking about his will being done in the world he created and about his great name being sanctified. May he give reign to his kingship in your lifetime, in your days, and in the lifetime of the entire family of Israel swiftly and soon. Uh, and then each, each day, after each phrase here, after each sentence, the congregation responds, Amen. And then it says, um, Blessed, praise, glorified, exalted, extolled, mighty, up, uh, upraised, and lauded. Be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he. Beyond any blessing and song, praise and consolation that are uttered in the world, now say, oh Amen. Don't, don't say that yet. May there be abundant uh, peace from heaven and life upon us all and upon all Israel. He who makes peace in his height, may he make peace upon us and upon all Israel. And so I realized that I had this, it was really like Hanukkah for me. Hanukkah had represented these man-made laws, rules, and regulations, the blessing and the lighting of the Hanukkah lamps. But when I actually got down to what Hanukkah originally meant, what it was really about, it wasn't about that. It had been hijacked into meaning that. And I decided I'm going to do the same thing and look at what Kaddish really means. Rather than standing by my principles and telling my mother, you know, too bad your son's not going to say Kaddish for, your, for his deceased father, I'm going to see, is this something that there's room to bend? Is this like something inherently pagan or is there something here that can be salvaged? And I looked at the history and I, guess what I found out? The origin of, the, of Hanukkah. Let's see if I can find this verse. Or excuse me, the origins of... Um, of Kaddish. The origins of Kaddish is a verse in Ezekiel. It's a verse in Ezekiel chapter something or another. Chapter 38. K-A-D-I-S-H. And specifically we're talking about the mourner's Kaddish. Because there are several different Kaddishes. This is the mourner's Kaddish. So uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, let's see. If it's, yeah, verse 23. And most translate the verse 23 as... It says, which is usually translated, and I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be, make myself known to the eyes of many nations, say many nations, many nations, and they will know that I am Yehovah. And this could legitimately be translated as, and I will be magnified, and I will be sanctified, and I will be made known to the eyes of many nations, and they will know that I am Yehovah. And that's how the rabbis understood it. And they said, okay, We've got to go out and sanctify the name of our Heavenly Father, the name of the Creator. And this is, what they, this is where the Kaddish comes from. And originally what happened where the Kaddish came from is rabbis, when they would give sermons and teach Torah, at the end of the sermon, they would say a prayer in accordance with this verse, the Kaddish prayer, to sanctify the name of the Creator, to proclaim His will in the universe, to proclaim the coming of His future kingdom and peace on earth. This is what the Kaddish originally uh, was, how it was originally done. And as time progressed, what happened is when a great rabbi would die, or a great teacher of Torah would die, his son, in order to show that he was continuing the legacy of teaching the Torah, going out and teaching the name to the world, at the funeral ceremony, actually the seventh, seventh day, seven days after 
the funeral, the end of the period of mourning, he would teach a Torah sermon and he would end it with the Kaddish. And that's where we get the mourner's Kaddish from. And when I read that, I couldn't believe it. I said, I was going to not do the Kaddish? <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what I need to do is the Kaddish. To go and proclaim, because this, I feel like in a sense, although my father and I disagree on many things, I feel in a sense that I'm continuing his legacy. And let me tell you a really quick story. I know we're almost running out of time. A quick story about my father. One of the first things my father ever taught me, and I was probably about three years old, sitting on his knee, literally sitting on his knee, in our living room on Shabbat, and he would say to me in his deep voice, he would say, Nechem Yisholom. He always called me Nechem Yisholom. Uh, Shalom is my middle name. He would say, Nechem Yisholom. How old was Avram Avinu when he came to know his God? Which Avram Avinu was Abraham, our father. And I would respond the answer he had taught me word for word. The Rambam th says he was 40 and the Ravad said he was 3. And this was a debate between these two 12th century rabbinical philosophers. And, and I think most people hearing that answer, that one rabbi says he was 40 and the other said he was 3. And I probably didn't even know who Abraham was. I was 3 years old myself. And I'm reciting these words my father taught me about a debate between 12th century rabbis. I think most people hearing that would say, don't confuse the kid, just give him the answer. But my father taught me something far more important than the answer. From my first Torah lesson, he taught me that it's okay to have different understandings of the Word of God. As long as we're united in our love of the Creator of the universe, it's okay if you think Abraham was 40, and it's okay if you think he was 3. That's fine, as long as you respect one another and love one another. There's no problem even knowing both answers. What's important is that you love the creator of the universe and want to live by his word. That's what he taught me. And that was a profound lesson, more important than how old Abraham when he was when he came to know his creator. Well, the next morning, Keith and I woke up, and Keith had this, was intent on taking me to Pike's Peak, which he calls his mountain. My mountain is Mount Sinai. His is Pike's Peak. He has a whole story about that. I won't go into it now. We're going up Pike's Peak on something called the Cog Train. It's a train that takes for over an hour to get to the top of the mountain. And as we're going up the mountain, I realize... My father at that very moment is being buried in Jerusalem. At that very moment, we're going up the mountain. It's a funeral. And I say to Keith, I've got to say the Kaddish up on that mountain. But there's one problem. You need t I need 10 people to say amen. That's, how the, that's the Kaddish. You say it because it's to sanctify the name before the eyes of the many nations. You got, have to have 10 people responding amen. And of course, in rabbinical tradition, it's 10 Jewish males. And so Keith said, okay, I'm number one, but <laughs> who are the other nine going to be? So I get to the top of the mountain. Everyone's rushing about because we only have like 20, 30 minutes on top of the mountain. And then the train goes down. And if you're not on the train, the conductor told us, what do you, happens if you, what do you call somebody who arrives one minute late for the train? A hiker. <laughs> so we're, I'm rushing around. Everyone's rushing around buying trinkets. And, and it's four, four degrees below zero outside. So no one's actually going to the peak of the mountain they spent over an hour to get to. They're all running around the gift shop. And I walk up to people and I say to them, random strangers I don't know, I say, my father died last night. And he's being buried right now in Jerusalem. Would you come outside and say this prayer to honor the memory of my father and sanctify the name of God? And all you've got to do is say amen. It's this Hebrew prayer. And I was able to, and not everybody said yes, but I was able to scrape together 10 people, actually 11. And they came out and we said this prayer on top of the mountain. And I'm going to end. Can I close with saying this prayer? Can I ask you to stand up and say this prayer with me? And all you have to do is say amen to sanctify the name of the creator of the universe. It's a short prayer. We'll do it real quick. When I say amen, just repeat amen. Yitkadal v'yitkadash me'raba. Amen. Be'alma. Amen. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. אמן.
Dear friend, at Biblical Foundations Academy International, we believe that God reveals His will and His way through His Word, and we want to help you understand it in an exciting way. We promise to continuously bring you what we consider to be lightning in a bottle through our video presentations, and you can now experience it for yourself in our Academy Premium Content Library. Imagine yourself sipping a cup of tea or coffee in the morning, tablet in hand, or maybe crunching into an apple during lunch with your smartphone propped up on your desk. Or perhaps settling into your favorite chair after a long day of work, laptop open, ready to dig deeper into the things of God. In our academy, you'll have 24-7 access to a digital library filled with resources that will bring biblical language, history, and context alive for you. These presentations will equip you to understand and apply God's instruction in your life wherever and whenever you are available. We have already produced three full television series. Two of them, Time Will Tell and The Road to Reformation, have already aired on primetime Christian television. Also included in our library is His Hollowed Name, a television series that has been remastered and re-released for all who want the information that was banned from a Christian television network in 2011 for being too controversial. And now available is the entire Open Door series with more than 18 hours of powerful teaching by Israeli Bible scholar Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson as they toured the country sharing the revelation of God's name and a whole lot more. Just by themselves, the DVDs of the three television series, plus the special video teachings, are valued at more than $250. But for as little as $7.99 a month, or $79 a year, you'll get access to the entire BFA Premium Content Library. As an added bonus, you will also have access to well over 100 other resources on the BFA International site, including dramatized readings, original songs, radio shows, and much more. When you join the Premium Content Library, you are helping us with the cost of producing even more inspirational content. In other words, your support will help us support you. Look for more exciting and spirit-filled programming coming soon to the Premium Content Library. Upgrade your free membership now. Simply enter the Academy, then use the Premium Content Library dialog box on the right. If you are not already a free member, simply visit bfainternational.com and click the Enter the Academy button to get started. Enter the Premium Content Library today.